Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm Michael Hagan from the class of 2015, and I'm joined by producer Chris Judge from the class of 2005. Today's episode takes us into the trenches of historical research and academic publishing, where American Studies student Daniel Rooney of the class of 2021 is turning groundbreaking findings about Russian immigrants deported from the United States in 1919 aboard the U.S. Army transport Buford into a chapter in a soon-to-be-published book. He's advised by Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, professor of history here at the college. Daniel, Dr. Johnson, thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's uh, thanks for having um, us. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's a real honor. Daniel, you arrived at Providence College a declared American studies major. What drew you to that program even before you started at PC? Uh, honestly, it's been my whole life. I've been kind of fascinated with American history. Um, my brother is a little bit older than me, so I was always fascinated. He was an American studies major. Um, in his college experience. I remember always being fascinated by his bookshelf, by things I would see, by projects he was doing. Um, And, you know, I just really wanted to learn more about American history, more than just the facts and figures. I think American Studies offers an important interdisciplinary work, uh, look at our culture, um, you know, about how we really got here rather than just looking at names and dates and things like that. So it was uh, a big draw Um, to kind of dig in a little bit deeper into our history for me. Has the program met your expectations? I'd say the program has absolutely exceeded my expectations. Um, The first professor I met on campus was Dr. Johnson. I learned that he would be my advisor. Um, And he has really pushed me to use all that the program has to offer. It's a very um, freeing program. There's a lot of disciplines that it covers. So, you know, I've taken classes anywhere from sociology to theology, English, black studies more, and and even more than that, Um, just to kind of get a more well-rounded view of what we're really trying to study. Um, And I think that the program allows us as students to kind of explore any area of American culture that we want to study it, it it almost forces us to look more deeply, you know, at at what we want to talk about. So I think that it's absolutely exceeded my expectations. So the breadth of the study actually forces you to take initiative to define a, a sort of niche within the study for yourself is what you're saying. It almost does. It it there are opportunities in so many different areas that you can kind of hone in on. Um, and Dr. Johnson's encouraged me to explore all those areas that, you know, I might even have just a little bit of interest in, you know, you see a class that you just might be interested in. And a lot of those classes do count for American studies do fit within the major. Um, so it's important to take advantage of the opportunities that it presents. But if you can take advantage of those, it's a very rewarding program to be a part of. Now, Dr. Johnson, you teach in the American Studies program, but you also direct the Graduate History program and are a professor of history. What distinguishes American Studies from an American History program? Yeah, Michael, that that's a really great question. Um, you know, I was trained as a historian, and one of the things, as an Americanist, but one of the things that Providence has allowed me to do is to be more active in American Studies. And I think to answer that question about what makes it different, um, and what I think is really empowering is sort of what Daniel was talking about, that there's a much broader reach to American studies, I think, than um, American history as a discipline. Um, And that comes in lots of different forms, as he mentioned, but I think a big part of that is interdisciplinarity. And the fact that in Daniel's own, you know, kind of coursework and experience at Providence, he's been able to take courses in English or sociology or political science or philosophy uh, that might quote unquote count for his major, but it really allows him to explore other areas and and disciplines. Um, I really appreciate too that American studies allows us to grapple in maybe an even more um, specific way, themes of race, class, and gender. Um, I think previously marginalized groups are central to the narrative and mission of American studies. And so I appreciate that. And the, the last piece that I'll say is I think that American studies allows us to engage with the contemporary um, in a way that perhaps history doesn't sometimes as a discipline allow us to do. That's not to say that historians don't do that and make a sort of comment about the world around us. But in a very liberating way, I think American studies does that. 
and allows us to kind of dip our toe into the contemporary and at times the subjective rather than the objective. And I think that's empowering. Daniel, when you arrived, what historical periods and topics were you most interested in? Uh, I've always been um, personally most interested in the decade of the 1960s. Um, I think that if you look at all the movements that were going on, there was the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, uh, multiple gay liberation movements, women's movements. There were so there was so much going on, and the part that has always been cool to me about the '60s is that a lot of that political activity was happening on college campuses. So it's always been very relatable for me to kind of look at that um, as a way to think maybe someone like me could have that big of an impact right on my own college campus. So I've always been fascinated by issues of civil rights, um, mostly with respect to the treatment of um, black and brown people in the country um, as it has progressed. But the 1960s really were what I had my eye towards um, in terms of what I was most interested in. You're a scholar after my own heart, Daniel. My favorite course as an undergrad was Dr. Mulderry's Roots of the 1960s course, um, which was a really fascinating. It, it really, in many ways, I think it was cross-listed with American studies um, because it was. It was so interdisciplinary. We considered so many different kinds of sources, all of that contributing to um, the sorts of revolutions that you described going on on college campuses and other places. So I'm going to resist the temptation to let this turn into a podcast about the 60s. Um, and I will ask you, Daniel, how did that path, how did, um, how did the path that you started on when you arrived at PC, um, how did that lead to your work with Dr. Johnson and ultimately lead you to the Buford? Yeah, so it kind of, the, the Red Scare, the 1920s era um, was never like the era that I was most interested in. Um, but when we get down to a very basic level of the story we wrote about here, it's a story about how the country treats very vulnerable populations. Um, and I think that that is a story that in any time period of a group of people is a story. So when Dr. Johnson emailed uh, me and asked if I wanted to be a part of his research project, he had this in mind. Um, I had read his book on the 1916 Preparedness Day bombing for American Studies 101, and he had mentioned that, you know, this, the Buford had come up in a couple of his sources that he was reading, and he wanted to do further research on it, and, you know, I loved his book. Um, it's, a, it's a new look at, again, the way the country treats its most vulnerable populations, um, some of its more radical populations, and that is no less interesting than any other period of American history. Um, it's really important work. And so when he gave me just a little bit about it, he said, you know, there's this ship I found. Over 200 people were deported for political reasons. I said, sign me up. So um, you, you began there to answer uh, what, what, what I was actually about to ask next, which um, is, you know, I confess to our listeners that before meeting Daniel, I had never heard of the Buford. Um, so Daniel, could, could you tell us what was it? Uh, sure. On a, on a pretty basic level, the USAT Buford was a cargo passenger ship um, that departed from Ellis Island on December 22nd, 1919 at dawn and landed in Hango, Finland on January 16th, 1920. Um, on board were 249 Russian immigrants, political deportees. Of them, 246 were men and three were women. And to our knowledge, there were 125 armed crew members on board. Um, we also know that because of the uh, supposed threat that these this population posed, um, that not many people knew about the voyage itself. Um, there was a select group of people that knew when it was going to leave and where it was going. Um, and eventually those 249 after landing in Finland on the 16th, boarded a train on the 17th and were returned um, to Turjoki, Russia, which is um, close to like modern day St. Petersburg. Dr. Johnson, could you set the historical scene for us a bit? It's 1919, the First World War has just ended. 
what's in the public consciousness and what's the political climate like in the United States? Sure. Um, I think, you know, Daniel's kind of work on this voyage and this ship really spoke to this broader context uh, and issue. And as he mentioned, it was the era of the Red Scare. And this ship with, uh, you know, over 200 people on board was dubbed in the press as the Soviet Ark. And so it was this kind of uh, out of sight, out of mind, mass deportation effort. And it came from a couple of contexts. During World War I, uh, amid all of the kind of patriotism that surrounded it, uh, there wasn't a unanimous sentiment that the United States should be involved in World War I. Um, we were certainly nervous about disloyalty and radicals uh, in the population. And so from various constituencies, there were real concerns surrounding World War I to really answer your question about the consciousness and political crime. But on the left, there were a number of people concerned about a growing militarism that they saw on the rise. There was concern about the intervention or the thought of intervention in Europe in a European war. There was concern too about conscription, which was a very hot button issue uh, about instituting a draft for such an effort. And so there was a lot of dissent. There was a lot of pushback uh, toward militarism, towards US involvement and so on. As Daniel alluded to really nicely on the right, there was a real growing sentiment, I think, of anti-radicalism. Um, and connected to that, as he mentioned, anti-immigrant attitudes. And so it wasn't uncommon for folks who, as Daniel mentioned, who were Russian immigrants to the United States to be identified first as some of the most disloyal among the United States population. And so even broader than that, just a general concern about patriotism and loyalty. So I think all of those issues are kind of wrapped up in this story here. So Daniel, where do the unwilling passengers of the Buford fit into this historical scene? Absolutely, Dr. Johnson, I think, set the stage very nicely. Um, what we have with the Buford in at least our estimation is a real like material event that codified kind of the anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, they were Russian nationals, the 249 that were deported. Um, we know that many of them were swept up in either the Palmer raids or other raids of meetings of the Union of Russian Workers, um, places that they knew a lot of Russians would be meeting. Um, we know that a lot of those arrested were soon released. Um, it was meant to kind of send a message to a lot of the Russians in the country about what could happen if they continued meeting and expressing their ideas freely. And we have 249 of them that the government decided were too big of a threat um, that were sent to Ellis Island and, and were deemed in the government's eyes to be too much of a threat to remain in the country. Now, beyond their political convictions and beyond um, their immigrant status, uh, what do we know about the lives of these passengers? Uh, what do we know about what the lives they left behind in the United States were like? Absolutely. We know, um, thankfully, we know a good bit about them. It started the process of beginning the research. We knew that um, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman were on board the ship, who are two of the most widely known um, political radicals of the time. So I started looking um, at their journals, at some of that, um, and I was picking up names, picking out little tidbits of information about people. Um, one day we were able to find the manifest, so we got a list of all 249 people that were there. Um, some of that, it was broken information, but some of it included ages, um, some of it included where they were arrested, um, but, you know, on a, on a basic level, we know that 199 of the 249 were members of the Union of Russian Workers. Um, we know that 43 of them were known to be anarchists. And perhaps most importantly for our research, we know that 12 of them at least um, were forced to separate from their families, forced to leave something behind when they left. Um, so beyond the beyond the manifest, beyond the journals of Goldman and others, um, what other sources were you able to find about the passengers and where did you find them? It was a lot of just running Google searches, running Library of Congress searches, um, searching our own PC libraries database, just typing in the names really of all the people that I could find, seeing if anything would come up. Um, there was really, that was kind of the only method to my research. I went, I had the list in an Excel sheet 
I would add in certain factors when I would see a name. Um, and eventually we started to realize that we were kind of on track to find a story, but we knew that we needed something a bit bigger than that. So eventually, um, after a long day of Google searching, I looked up the name Ivan Nakikov, who was on the manifest and I was scrolling through, you know, a bunch of sources that I had already seen. And I came upon Mrs. Ivan Nakikov in a Senate testimony from a woman named Helen Todd, who represented the American Women's Committee, who then went on to list the situations. They, they compiled a report of all of the women, mothers, families that were left behind, um, and they presented that to the Senate. So that's that was our gold mine source um, that gave us a lot of the stories that we thought needed to be told. It's, it's like hard to explain how cool the feeling was because I, I had clicked through like five pages of things and I finally found this and I, I knew that it was something. And then I scrolled down and see another name that matches the manifest, keep scrolling and it's just all these names. I called Dr. Johnson right away. I said, I think, I think we found our story. Dr. Johnson, what was it like to get that phone call from Daniel when he found that treasure trove of sources? It it was awesome. And, and as he just described, he was doing, you know, a lot of really good detective work. And I know he was spending a lot of time, not just with congressional documents, but sources from the Library of Congress, the American Memory Project, and scrolling through these newspapers. And he'd created this, you know, Excel spreadsheet. And as we talked about the ideas, we weren't really sure what was going to be our angle, what, what was going to be our story. And, and we, we kind of kept thinking it would, it would really happen for us. And so he was right. We had found the moment. And, you know, there, there is and has been a little bit of scholarship perhaps on the contextual part of the journey of the deportations and the ship. But what's so great about what Daniel uncovered is he had found his moment because of these spouses and significant others who were essentially left behind. And so he had his angle and it really was a eureka moment. So Daniel, what was the most moving story that you uncovered? It's honestly, it's hard to pick one as the most moving. I mean, we found stories that were truly tragic, but they were all kind of equally moving. Um, we were able to kind of separate them into three categories that we found. So the first group of the widows, what we call the Buford's widows, um, were those mothers with young children that were left destitute um, that were forced to rely on close friends as their only stable source of any financial support. Um, we found a second group of mothers who were evicted from their homes, um, either for failure to make rent or more commonly um, because of their association with the husband or the father that was deported. Um, the sentiment remained strong even after these men and women were deported. Um, and then we found an intersecting third group of mothers with young children who were evicted from their homes, who, you know, have just these absolutely tragic stories that are, it's almost hard to write. Um, I would say that the most moving stories, there were two for me. Um, one was Mrs. Andrew Lazarowicz, who went into labor two days after the Buford set sail with her first child. Um, the joy that would be brought about by bringing a new life into the world um, set against the context of, you know, a now fatherless home. Um, and I would also say the story of Mrs. Eugenia Vanoff, who was a 65 year old, not physically well woman who was cared for um, by John Benal. We could not find the relation between the two, but we know that they lived together and that John was her main caretaker and source of financial support because she could not work. Um, and he was deported on the Buford. And when the American Women's Committee found her to compile this report, they had found that she had not eaten for two days. She had become very ill um, and that she was, you know, really just had no way of saving herself. So those, I think the story about 
the mother who goes into labor and brings her first child into the world two days into the voyage and the elderly woman who relied on someone for her source of income, for a source of stability that now is hungry with no way to support herself were probably the two most moving stories um, that, that we found. Such heartbreaking stories. Daniel, do we know anything more about the deportees once they arrived in Russia or the families that they left behind? We don't have a lot of evidence about what happened, what might have happened to these um, deportees once they got to Russia. Um, we do know through the work of the American Women's Committee, um, through the report that they established, um, that there were groups advocating, specifically the Women's Committee, there were groups advocating for these women to be brought back to Russia, to be reunited, these families to be reunited with, um, with their husbands and their fathers. And they did succeed in, um, to our knowledge, raising over $1,000 for the families to try to get the money, seed money, um, to get back to Russia. Um, but we also know that the reason that Helen Todd was testifying in the Senate is because she was looking for help obtaining passports for these women. Um, they couldn't get passports, so they couldn't get back to Russia. So many of them never saw their husbands or fathers again. So Dr. Johnson, when you realized that this project could be worthy of publication, um, and, and even before that point, um, how did you begin to shepherd Daniel's research and, and this process of moving from idea to research to execution to publication? Yeah, thanks. That's a, it's a great question. Uh, the process was kind of an interesting one. Um, I had gotten interested in this topic um, with my last book um, on San Francisco, and, and that was kind of framed in this context of the Red Scare and so on. And almost as a footnote, um, the Soviet arc and the Buford is kind of mentioned. And so I thought this would be a fun idea at some point to kind of pick up and dig a little bit more um, on these deportations. And so I submitted a conference proposal for May of 2019 um, at the University of Newcastle in England. They had a conference on 1919 uh, as this kind of global challenge uh, of peace was the theme. And there were some really incredible scholars there. So I, I kind of had this idea and I kind of wanted to do a little bit more uh, on the deportation. So that was in the works for me to go, I think it was sort of at the end of May after the spring semester had ended. But meanwhile, um, the Undergraduate Research Committee sponsors this summer research grant and that's through the Center for Engaged Learning. And so I saw that solicitation, that's when I reached out to Daniel and said, hey, I'm gonna start working on this. I know I'll be presenting on it. Um, I'll let you know what kind of feedback I get you know, when I come back to the US and, and, and if you get it, we'll go from there. And that's kind of how um, the project got underway. It's sort of origin story, if you will. And we were kind of um, off and running. And so that, that was the initial phase of it. And then I think by the fall of 2019, the conference organizers started to do a little bit of follow-up and, and particularly Professor Matthew Perry himself, a labor historian, at Newcastle reached out and asked Daniel and I if we would like to have our um, essay included in the volume uh, as a chapter. So we made the revisions and the proposal went off to the University of Liverpool Press. And I think we signed the contract in October of 2020. So it is officially forthcoming. So that's kind of the, the story of, of where it came from and, and kind of the investment by some kind folks at the college and the project and then sort of how it came to fruition in terms of the publication. Um, were there other opportunities that presented themselves to, to present the work? Uh, will there be other opportunities in the future? I, I think on, on the one hand, yes. Um, I know that Daniel was involved in the Center for Engaged Learning's you know, celebration of scholarship and creativity um, before I think the pandemic um, settled in. Um, and so we, we certainly had that opportunity for Daniel to show off what he had been up to under the auspices of, of the research grant. And I hope that we'll get to do something else with it. Um, I'm kind of secretly hoping that they'll do some kind of book launch or something. And as the world settles into normal, Daniel and I'll get to go to the UK or something for that. We'll see. Daniel, what have you learned about academic publishing through all of this? That's a good question. I think, um, Dr. Johnson has taught me a lot about kind of the mental aspect of 
what to do with work that you do because you feel like your own work is very important and you know there might be at least for me like a little voice in the back of your head that says well you know what are the odds that anyone else cares about this but it's about taking you know the first step not being afraid to just send it out to whoever wants to read it and the worst thing they say is no uh another option is that they review it for you and give you feedback and a third option is that like with professor perry you know it, it he wants it to be included um as a chapter in a book so it's really about the mental side of finding a story worth telling and then not being afraid to just send it to whoever will read it. Yeah. And being persistent and being persistent with the revisions and those kinds of things, because they, you know, they didn't agree to publish it, I think, sight unseen. You know, we had to go through a couple of uh, revisions. And, and so before we got the contract, you know, it's hard work. And, you know, D Daniel knows as well as anyone, he'll probably say that, it, you know, it, it, it takes a little bit of tenacity in that way too to, to continue to get revisions back, make revisions, those kinds of things uh, on the path to publication. It's a, it's a challenging process, but it's a fun one. Daniel, did you, over time, did it begin as something that was uncomfortable, unfamiliar and become something that you kind of became more familiar, more comfortable, more confident with? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the familiar term imposter syndrome, which uh, anyone who's tried to do any serious academic research or writing knows of. Um, it, it, it sounds like you were able to defeat imposter sy syndrome pretty soundly, um, but what was that process like? I mean, obviously, at the beginning, I knew that this was something that Dr. Johnson was very interested in. Um, and I, I, all I had was really just like an initial kind of gut reaction that I wanted to be a part of it. But I didn't know anything about it. So it was hard for me to kind of develop any strong, I guess, passion for it, maybe at the beginning. Um, it was really, once I found the source, it wasn't about finding the source, but once I found the stories that I felt needed to be told. Um, and I started thinking about how they relate to everything that I care about in American history, which is how the country treats its most vulnerable populations. I, I found that kind of passion. I felt like it was a story that needed to be shared. Um, so I, I do love learning about the Red Scare, um, mostly from Dr. Johnson. Um, but I love, you know, I love this whole process of studying, of, of writing, of digging up research, a little detective work is, it, again, like Dr. Johnson said, it's a very fun process. Why is it so important that this story be told to today's audiences? I think that we kind of tried to make a connection to, you know, maybe from 2019 back to 1919, where we we're kind of living in an era where family separation was an important topic, where immigration and deportation was kind of a hot topic. Um, so we found that this story had a real connection to that story. Um, I did a little research, contemporary research um, on, you know, some men that have been deported in more recent years, the effects that that has had on families and tried to find a connection to bridge the past to the present. And I think we found a pretty good one um, so it's, it's a story that applies as much today as it did back then. And it's going to apply in a hundred years as much as it does right now. So Dr. Johnson, in terms of the historical field, um, what kind of contribution does Daniel's research make to the field and what are its implications? Uh, that's a great question. I, I think two things. One is what Daniel was able to uncover, and I think what we were able to write up, um, is he's able to do what is essentially social history at its best. He's putting a very authentic voice and face to the experience, not only of radicals, but also family members, which in the historical narrative wouldn't necessarily be front and center. And so he's able to use these primary sources and original testimonies and the Senate commission and all of these kinds of reports to tell that story. And so that was our, again, our eureka moment where we knew that that was, that was the angle that would be of significance. But the other thing, just to dovetail off of what Daniel was just mentioning, um, and part of what I'm particularly proud of, um, of Daniel and, and, and about his work is that he's thinking and thought when doing the project and the research 
in a very American studies way methodologically. You know, he was able to make this connection to the present and frame it in what is an unfortunate contemporary context, as he mentioned, of family separation. And so I was so impressed when he submitted a draft of that conclusion and it included that contemporary work that he had mentioned. And he leaves little doubt for the reader in that he's able to get to that so what question, which always sort of nags us in terms of scholarship. Why does this matter? And here is Daniel able to say, look, 1919, unfortunately, is not particularly different from 2019, and, and here's why. So Daniel, what would you say to students at PC or even prospective students who are considering Providence College um, who might be interested in doing independent research or sponsored research, research supervised by a faculty member? What would you say to them about uh, developing the germ of an idea or a hunch into a project of this scale? I would say that for me, the best advice I could give is uh, to not be afraid of expressing an idea of trying to get to the heart of an idea that you have, um, not you know, thinking that maybe, like I said earlier, maybe that other people won't care about it or that it's not important. If you have an idea, if you have something that you think is worth pursuing, odds are someone else is going to find that idea worth pursuing as well. I think in terms of doing undergraduate research, um, developing a strong bond with the professor you're working with, with the professor you might be interested in working with, um, going out of your way to kind of establish that relationship. I think Dr. Johnson and I had a, a great relationship before this, and I think we used that. We know we work well together. I know I work well with him. Um, and I think we used that to kind of develop this idea. So that's another aspect I would, I would recommend, getting to know your professors, getting to know their areas of expertise, what they're interested in, and seeing if that you can make that match with what your idea might be or how you're feeling. Um, and then again, just it was, it was a frustrating process for maybe like the first month. We weren't finding like a ton but it's about always you know, having hope that that source is going to be out there, that you're going to find it eventually. Um, so about perseverance, maybe not giving up. Um, once you find that you have something special, don't, don't really let it go too easily. I'm making note of all of this for when I try to get back into the academic research game. <laughs> So thank you, much appreciated. Um, so you are a uh, you're a senior. Uh, so I will go ahead and ask the dreaded question of what's next, and um, how will the lessons that you've learned at Providence College and through this project figure into it? Yeah, it's uh, actually I'm not as scared of this question anymore because I was just notified that I've been accepted to serve with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps next year, um, which will be congratulations. Oh, thank you very, very much. Um, it is a gap year pro service program. Um, I will be matched with an organization that matches my interests, um, moving to a, an area of a city that I don't know, an impoverished area doing outreach work, um, either in a legal or educational setting. Um, and eventually, you know, I hope to go on to law school and pursue a dream of being a civil rights lawyer, um, fighting for those marginalized, fighting for people like women, the, the Buford's widows, um, fighting for all the people that I've learned about in American studies. I think that's, that's the dream. I think Providence College American Studies program has really helped me get there and hone my skills in a way that's gonna make that effective. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more in store. All right. Well, Daniel, I wish you absolutely all the best. I am sure that we will be inviting you back as a distinguished alumnus before long. And uh, Dr. Johnson, best of luck to you finding a new research assistant. Thank you both for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. This was a lot of fun. Subscribe to the Providence College podcast in all the usual places, including iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, as well as your smart speaker. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Thanks for listening and go Friars.